Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Residential Life and Housing, Kendra, Larissa, Rick. Uh, Towns up for Larissa, right? This is, this is wonderful. Thank you to all of those who helped put this on. Thank you, RAs. Thank you for the invitation. This is a tad surreal that we're calling this my last lecture because my wife and I are getting on a plane at zero dark 30 in the morning, so it's not an omen or anything like that. Okay, so just please, Lord. So, well, I am thrilled and honored and humbled by this opportunity, and I hope to make this meaningful uh, as much as possible. But there are some people I would like to thank, and I tried to think of ways that I could do that. And then I thought, you know, what I'm going to do is just thank them the way I did in my dissertation. My dissertation, which some of you uh, who had me for Comp 1 and Comp 2 last year, uh, the reason why I had even bigger bags under my eyes was we were working on that together. And so uh, my family is in the second to last row. As we would know, that's the penultimate row. I love that word, penultimate. So I want to uh, thank my wife, Sally, who is solely responsible for my return to graduate school. She serves as my inspiration and my best friend. I dedicate this dissertation and this uh, evening to my wife, Sally, without whose undying support, this dream would never have been fulfilled. Let's give it up and add props. And I, I'm grateful to Tyler, my son-in-law, and Abby, my daughter, for their faithful support through this arduous process and for always being in my corner. So what, what for them? And I wrote this, but I really mean it. I'm profoundly blessed to work alongside some remarkable uh, faculty members and administrators at Northwest University in Kirkland, Washington. And just for example, this afternoon, there was something wonderful. Um, Dr. Jim Hugel, our provost, and Dr. Sarah Drivdahl, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences took Dr. Wilmari and I and our colleagues in communication studies and English out for lunch. And it was wonderful. And, and I'm telling you, it was great. However, there's more to writing a dissertation than eating at a fancy place and um, having people say all kinds of nice things to you. I, Sarah is getting ready to uh, embark on her own PhD. And the Lord is going to get her into the right school uh, if she keeps writing the way she has. And I've seen in her application, it's great. I've got to tell you, though, there's a whole lot more to writing a dissertation than eating fancy food and having people say nice things. There were the two years plus where my family put up with me very sleepy and going through that process. And that relates very much to what I want to share with us tonight. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for this incredible honor, privilege, and opportunity tonight. I pray, God, that I might be able to communicate half of what you've put in my heart to say. Please forgive me for the ways in which my personality might stand in the way of saying what you want to say. Speak through me to your students. Let it be something meaningful to them. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Come on, somebody. Okay, so... Um, so my talk tonight, and of course, if you know me, we had to get a whiteboard with markers, and we'll have some other things. No index cards, no free writing, but um, my talk's entitled Waiting in the Wings. And maybe a theatrical motif isn't what's going to help you. Maybe you want to think of my talk as entitled Sitting on the Bench, or Practicing Piano Scales, or Running Suicides on the Basketball Floor waiting in the wings. See, we're a nation who idolizes her celebrities. Stars of stage and screen, music and sports figures, they all loom larger than life. They garner the largest number of Twitter followers, like Katy Perry. We gawk at them on television and newspapers and magazines. We go to their concerts and sporting events. We snap up any merchandise they endorse. And celebrities pull down salaries annually most of us will never see in a lifetime. And yet, our heroes are not always heroic. The limelight accentuates failures of substance abuse, immorality, and greed. And as quickly as one star rises to fame, a star can vanish. Our world's priorities will likely be rocked when we stand before God. Certainly, the people whom he will honor will be those known only to a few, right? 
Who did Jesus honor? The widow who gave her final two pennies in the offering. The good Samaritans who do for others, not letting their right hand know what their left hand is doing that. Those students who do what Mason suggested in chapel on Wednesday and give up a meal at Chipotle in order to save some people from a life of sex trafficking, maybe even here under our noses in Seattle. See, students of Northwest University, this may seem grandiose, but I want you to know you are my heroes. Honestly, and you might think, who, me, a hero? What have I done that's so heroic, right? How? See, it's in many unsung ways you faithfully show yourself truly heroic in mundane ways that no one applauds. Paying your tithes and generously supporting the cause of Christ through missions week in and week out. Doing, doing your daily devotions. Listening to a friend in crisis. Now, I hate to break it to you, but you may never place your hands in wet cement on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. (laughs) Sorry. But what we all strive for is eternal recognition, right? One day, we will all stand before the Lord, and what we want to hear is, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. That's the recognition for which we must work. Now, I'm in my second academic year, and I'm privileged to be serving in my dream job at Northwest University. I am not kidding you. I've wanted to do this my whole life. And what am I doing? I'm teaching English to people whose ministries will be lived out in courtrooms and classrooms, pulpits and printing presses, kitchens and concert halls, huts and hospitals. And because of my background in secular university campus ministry through a ministry called Chi Alpha, I've tried really hard to strike from my working vernacular this phrase, full-time ministry. In fact, I disagree with the use of the phrase. Everyone who follows Christ is a minister of the gospel, vocational or volunteer, under the banner of what President Castleberry called an academic convocation, the priesthood of the believer, drawn from 1 Peter 2.9. 2.9. First Peter 2.9. For you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a kingdom. Uh, you know, we are those priests, right? So I address my fellow ministers today, not even future ministers, because God wants you students to know he's granting you ample ministry opportunities every day. It's not someday, it's right now. But at the At the verge of turning 50, the same year that I celebrate 25 years as an ordained Assemblies of God minister, please hear me when I warn you of an occupational hazard of the priesthood. And that's whether you earn a paycheck for it or you perform your service for free. Ministry can introduce you to something I would call limelight addiction. And it will kill you. Limelight addiction, that's where you love the spotlight, you love the accolades of human beings, and you have to avoid it at all, ti- at all times. It's a ravenous malady that eventually destroys any Christian leader's judgment, and I speak to you as a recovering limelight addict tonight. I know what I'm talking about because every once in a while, the approval of other people really entices me to compromise what I know to be true. And deep down, don't we all crave the accolades of other people, right? We don't necessarily want to be in front. Some of us say, please, no, I don't want to be in front. But we want approval, especially certain people's approval. And even we introverts who prefer to be alone performing creative tasks by ourselves, we're lost in the art of making and writing and playing and reading to standing in the spotlight, per se. We all want to hear people's affirmation, whether in a text, a tweet, a thank you note, or glowing word from someone we respect. And when we experience what I would call an affirmational drought, that means a dry time when it seems that nobody is, is appreciating us or telling us how awesome we are, we can find ourselves languishing for external approval. And this desire to win the attention of others can drive us to dangerous extremes. In the Old Testament, the upstart Prince Absalom 
comes back to the kingdom, but his father David won't see him, and he's so desperate for attention, what does he do? He lights the fire, uh, lights on fire the fields of David's chief of staff, Joab, and that gets his attention, and it, it starts the spiral, however, of the beginning of his demise by that one cowardly act. So let me stop briefly to tell you a quick story about a time when I was barely older than most of you. Okay, so I was, I think, about 24 at the time. And this is where I came to believe resu resolutely the central theme of tonight's talk. So let's be real. Have you ever uttered a prayer and thought, oh, could I get that back, please? <laughs> Just kidding. Fingers crossed. Jesus knows when you didn't have your fingers crossed, okay? If you get nothing else out of tonight. And I remember it was a tough time. So um, I was a 24-year-old husband and father of one. I had been a husband for about two years. I was a youth pastor and I was working 60 hours per week because the senior pastor had quit and the church board decided just to dump all of the responsibilities without additional pay except for preaching because they thought that would go to my head on me. And so I was visiting everybody in the hospital and doing all of these things and it was just crazy. And, and and yet I wasn't getting any recognition for it. I wasn't getting any money for it. And so I found myself in the sanctuary. And as was my practice, I was, I was uh, pacing and praying and, and saying, oh, God, does anybody know who I am? Does anybody care? Is, is anybody paying any attention? And all of a sudden, I stopped. I know exactly. I was standing by a stained glass window. And I stopped and I said out loud, if your will calls me to obscurity, I will serve you there. And I went, oh, JK. <laughs> Let's try that again. If your will calls me to the Nobel Prize for Literature, I will serve you. No, I can't get those words back. And I knew it was a prophetic word I was delivering for myself. And I'm telling you, I didn't realize then how prescient that prayer was for the next two and a half decades that followed. So this is the theme of my life in ministry. Faithfulness in obscurity. So now, when I say obscurity, and you, you'll quickly learn this is an all skate. We all play, okay? When I say obscurity, what words come to mind? Any of you? Obscurity. No one's, no one's watching. Hidden. Hidden. Lonely. Lonely. Outsider. Outsider. It, it, that doesn't sound really exciting, right? <laughs> That's not what I went forward uh, the Thursday night of youth camp to say, yes, I'll be called to this thing called ministry. No, that's not what I was doing it for. And, and I'm telling you, I've settled on this metaphor, waiting in the wings. You know what I mean by that, right? So before a person goes on in a theater or a concert, and it's their turn to play, they're listening for the cue line, but they're standing back, and no one can see them. And this is very tough for me because I thrive on adrenaline. <laughs> I like the rush of stepping out on stage and seeing if all my hard work has paid off and, and if this is that chance that I'm going to have. But as a recovering adrenaline deadline and approval junkie, though, I could regale you with stories of how many days came and went with long pastoral counseling appointments that the couple divorced anyway. Or the times I went to the hospital bed, sorry, I prayed for someone and they died. Or I had worked and worked at crafting that sermon and they promptly forgot it on the way to the car, picking their lunch spot after Sunday lunch. Was it all for nothing? N absolutely not. Nevertheless, God has been faithful over the years, even the 20 years in the pastorate where I said, Lord, are you ever going to let me have this dream of being a professor at a Christian university? And for me, my education has always been an Isaac in my life. And you know the story. And so on the, on the top of Mount Moriah, here's, here's Abraham and Isaac's tied up. 
and he's about ready to plunge the knife in, but along comes the ram. And I'm like, okay, here's my dream, God. Um, I'm really going to do it now. I'm really going to drop the knife. He's going to die. Where's the ram? And once again, I had to die to myself and know it wasn't the time. It wasn't the time until it finally was the time, 20 years. Someone once told me that it was 17 years from the time God gave Joseph in the Old Testament the dream until he saw his brothers, the sheaves of wheat, lying on Egyptian tile, and he saw the dream fulfilled. 17 years. Mine didn't involve imprisonment, but, uh, but it was tough. So what am I talking about? Long periods of waiting in the wings off stage, followed by minor, temporary, little moments in the limelight. And if you're looking for, as you would in uh, a rhetoric and research writing class, which I teach, um, if you are looking for a thesis or a proposition tonight, here it is. How you perform in the limelight of ministry success is directly related to how faithfully you rehearsed in backstage obscurity, knowing that you perform ultimately for an audience of one. Let me say that again. How you perform in the limelight of ministry success, any success, is directly related to how faithfully you rehearsed in backstage obscurity, knowing that you ultimately perform for an audience of one. So translated, God cannot bless someone who steals his glory. The person who only serves him for the platform time or the approval of others. But the lesson is more basic than that. If you only call on God in a jam, your strength will falter in the day of adversity. And if, however, you daily seek his face and keep serving him despite the mundaneness of everyday moments, then when trials come, you will sense his presence nearby. Therefore, we have to embrace the obscure moments for the lessons they afford us in Christ. So from the Crayola drawing on mom's refrigerator to the trophy your high school soccer or softball team won last year, don't we all like recognition? Come on, let's be real. A couple of related questions then nag for our attention tonight, and we're going to try to answer them together. What does that need for recognition say about us as human beings, and how then do we serve God during obscurity when it feels like no one is recognizing our efforts, not even Him? How does that need for recognition, what does it say about us as human beings? And how then do we serve God during obscurity when it feels like no one is recognizing our efforts, not even Him? So keep those questions in mind as I continue. I was on a missions trip many years ago in Mexico, and a man whose name I have forgotten uh, came up to me, at, and it was a tent, because Mexico, and of course, like, <laughs> Hundreds of people had gotten saved and bodies healed because Mexico. And, uh, and this man came up, and he didn't realize that he was delivering a life verse to me. It's Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18. And it says... Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. What is that verse saying to us? I don't have to look at the results. And even if the results don't tell me that I'm doing a good job, if I'm doing it for Jesus, that's what matters. The rejoicing comes from a deep awareness that despite appearances or the seeming lack of any fruit, also known as the visible results of your labors, God sees and God knows. Everybody say, God sees. God sees. And God knows. God knows. Now, God prefers deeds done in secret. Sometimes when things seem the darkest, you're actually closest to the Father than some in the limelight of ministry success ever experience. And these moments when I've questioned the silence, what I thought was the silence of God or the darkness of God, I've been reminded of what Psalm 91 says. 
He who abides in the shadow of the Most High will rest, or he who abides in the shelter of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What do we know about a shadow? It's dark. But where is it darkest? Closest to the object casting the shadow. So when I'm going through dark times where it feels like heaven is silent, maybe Jesus is standing right next to me, and why he's not talking is he's silently weeping with me instead of offering me the pat answers to my childish questions like, why doesn't anyone seem to notice my pain? Or why do I have to keep doing the right thing when clearly it isn't paying off? See, God prefers deeds done in secret because he knows that they are performed for an audience of one, for his renown alone. So what did Jesus say about the way to pray? Did he say we're supposed to do so lavishly and ostentatiously and, and with big words and, 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 and fancy gestures? No, those were pharisaical displays. He said that we're to pray privately. So I've asked three of my friends to read for us. So we have Matthew 6, 6, NIV. Nice and loud. So it says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, and now the Amplified. And finally, just keeping it real, we have the message. Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense His grace. So what do you get from those verses? Anyone? Be still and know that I am God. What else? It's just between me and God. And he's keeping record. He's got the vial and he's catching every one of the teardrops that no one else seems to see rolling down your cheek. What else? It's all about him, and it's not about the recognition that others can offer you because that is so fleeting, okay? Um, so I've come to find a paradox in walking with Jesus for the last 30 plus years, and I call it the cover-up conundrum. What's a conundrum? A riddle, a puzzle, a word like conundrum that you don't know the, the uh, <laughs> definition of until you get the context. So here's what I have found. What I want and what God wants, okay? And what I've come to discover is I want to conceal the things or hide the things that God wants brought out in the open. And conversely, God wants to keep in secret the things I want exposed for all to see, giving them yet another reason to praise me openly, okay? Does that tension register with you? What I want is I want to keep certain things concealed, and God wants these things right out in the open. And we'll talk about what some of those things might be. Conversely, I want to keep things hidden, or I want to keep things, sorry, I want things to be known that he wants just for him. So I want you to be thinking about things that might fit in that category, okay? I want to conceal what God wants open and out in the open. Do any come to mind? What do I want to conceal? I want to, yeah, I definitely want to conceal my brokenness, right? But what does Psalm 51 say? A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. I want to conceal my depression, right? I, it tends to isolate me. And even though it feels like a wet blanket, it's something that's very familiar. But God wants me to share that with someone else and maybe with somebody who has some degrees after his or her name so that I can be changed and so that I am not defined by a depression that has, that has in the past affected my life. What else do I want to conceal? Sin, <laughs> right? You go, please, 
dear God, he's not going to start listing his sins. No, <laughs> no, we don't have a big enough whiteboard. But, um, but I want to conceal even areas of temptation. Proverbs 9, 17, stolen water is sweet, food eaten in secret is delicious. And that's not just chocolate layer cake, right? So, but I also want to conceal my sin. And yet God has this incredible way. I heard somebody once say, and, and, and be aware of this is if you're planning to go into vocational ministry um, as opposed to volunteer ministry, a pastor is someone God is working on publicly. A pastor is someone God is working on publicly. Come on, have you ever been someplace and gotten less than Nordstrom stellar customer service? My family already knows the story I'm going to tell because we are returning to the state where it happened, the state where it happened, the state where it happened. Okay, we're going to Nebraska tomorrow, and in Cozad, Nebraska, Cozad is just, is, is, is now uh, code for where Clint lost it. <laughs> we're at a Burger King, and let's just say in the land of cattle, when you go in and say, I'd like a Whopper with cheese but no meat, they act like you're saying, I'd like you to cut off my arm and serve it to me, okay? Like, this is so strange. So I made a fool of myself when somebody got my order wrong, which is stupid. I mean, I could stand to, you know, skip a few French fries, right? But I looked back and saw my family just aghast at at how, how much of a fool I had made of myself. And I can't tell you, for the 25 years as a pastor, any time I was in public and I just, i just going to let somebody have a piece of my mind, just as I was starting to, somebody go, oh, pastor, how's it going? <laughs> Great. Great. Okay? And that's the mercy of God to do that. I mean... He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but the man who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. That's Proverbs 28, 13. This is why we need one another. And no one holds you accountable, friends. You make yourself accountable to someone else. So don't make other people chase you down and make you open up. They don't have to come at you with a spiritual crowbar. You're supposed to do that. Okay? Even responding to a conviction. I mean, did anybody else come to Christ later? For me, it was 16. Like, every time the gospel message was presented, I was down at the altar before they, well, it was not guitars, it was organ. But anyway, <laughs> I'm there, right? And, and quickly I learned at the altar, oh, wow, I don't hear everybody's voices. They might, must all be praying silently. Oh, we don't come forward in this church for every altar call. My bad. And then suddenly, I would sit, fast forward five years, I'd sit here, and God would say, you need to go to the altar. You need to confess that thing. You need to be prayed for. But what will people think of me? I'm the pastor, right? I can't do that. And I can't tell you how many times God said, are you going to pay more attention to other people or to me? And then, I definitely want to conceal painful past experiences. I want to conceal, and so do you, the skeletons in my closet that are stinking up my psyche. And I'm a big proponent of counseling. There should be no stigma whatsoever for Christians who go to counseling. If you need to leave because you go, you go to counseling? Absolutely, and it has changed my life. Seeing a therapist at times when life felt overwhelming has helped me immensely. But let me just ask about this tendency to want to conceal. Why do human beings love darkness? Why do we like to conceal things? Well, Jesus said it's because our hearts were evil and our deeds are evil. We don't want to be found out. This is why so-called adult establishments and taverns have few windows and Google Chrome allows users to erase browsing histories or open incognito windows that do not track sketchy websites. What does Paul declare in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 through 8? He says, So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. 
See, when we harbor personal rebellion against God, our exaggerated fear is that our deeds will be exposed. Sin hides. Sin sows crude fig leaves and crouches in shrubbery. But in the very first act of covenant, God's grace covers up his disgraced children because what does God, as he's banishing Adam and Eve from the garden, what does he clothe them in? in animal pelts, and those animal pelts are probably still, sorry for the word, moist from the blood of the animals who gave their lives, because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, okay? And recall that 1 Peter 4.8, and I think this is a New Testament life verse for me, 1 Peter 4.8, love covers over a multitude of of sins. That's why God wants me to get things out is so that his love and his grace can cover over them. Truth brings one into the light of God's love, remembering he is omniscient, all seeing and all knowing. And here we experience the freedom of knowing and being known by God and others. And see, when we get the guts up to come and talk to a fellow brother about something that's really going on, right? Have you ever just really, I call it the hup-ups, right? When you got the, <laughs> just give me a second. <laughs> Hold on. And then you say, Hello. this is what I'm struggling with. And first of all, the person goes, that's it? <laughs> me too, right? And that's not because we all want to relish in our own sin. It's we understand there is no sin that, you know, no temptation except that which is common to us. And God is able to, to provide a door of escape uh, when we are tempted. It's in our weakness that Christ is made strong. So we shouldn't hide our brokenness. We hate to appear weak, but it is on our weakness that he is made strong. And besides, my hopeless dependence on the Lord plainly portrays that any good work that I may accomplish in this life originated with God, not solely by human effort. God is interested in making his name famous. He will use you if you'll humble yourself before him, but if you won't, he'll go on and he'll use somebody else. And he's not that interested, sorry, about your earning a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame unless you plan to redeem that, that entertainment career for his glory. He alone deserves and receives top billing, and he shares credit with no one, nor should he. Now, I want this thing known, but God wants it to be a secret. This one might be a little easier to talk about. Give me an example. I want it known, and God says, uh-uh-uh, just for me. What? Tithing. Service. Service. Anything else come to mind? Okay. Talents. I mean, let's just say the way I give my money, right? Matthew 6, 2 through 4. What does Jesus say? So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. Remember, hypocrites was from ancient Greek uh, dramaturgy and it meant play actors. So what the play actors do, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay? But let's be a lot more honest than that. I want to expose another person's faults or mistakes. <laughs> okay? And let me just be honest with you. They, they know this is coming. This is going to probably be on my tombstone, but you get it for free. We hate in others what we're blind to in ourselves. So if somebody is really irking you, Probably it's because Jesus is trying to point out that you have a similar fault. We hate in others what we're blind to in ourselves. So when somebody else does something wrong, I want to expose them, right? I want to expose their sin, even Facebook shame them. Although we're unaware of our intent or are intensely private about our own wrongdoing. I want credit for any accomplishment. Now we're really going to get real, and here you'll say, now, 
does Joy vet the speakers before she invites them? What's going on? Here's how I knew I was an approval addict. I was at a pastor's conference, and there in of itself should probably start conjuring up some ideas. And it was in the city of Chicago, a city that we loved being in and being a part of. But we had moved there. I had many years ago, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I had worked with Pastor Phil in Springfield, Missouri. And so I had moved from Missouri to Illinois, where we spent the next seven years, and we had gone to a conference in Chicago. Okay? But when we were in, Ch in Springfield, Missouri, our pastor pastored the largest church in our denomination. It wasn't as large then as it is now, but we taught the college Sunday school class. And we had come from the city of Chicago down to Missouri. Talk about your culture shock. And um, they said, do you want to teach Clinton Sally? Do you want to teach the college Sunday school class? We had more on the first day of college Sunday school class in Missouri than in our church on Easter Sunday. And so, you know, we had had this great experience and kind of known the pastor, but let's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it again. So let me tell you, uh, let me tell myself. So I'm sitting in this conference, and I won't even blame it on a little guy in red pajamas sitting over here talking to me. You go, it's the wrong shoulder, it's this one. So I, I said, I'm going to ask a question, not because the content of the question means anything, but if I ask the question, let's say Milando is the famous pastor, and I put my hand up, he'll call on me by my first name. Uh, this is what is happening. OK, you're going, I'm out. This is just scan me out now that I'm getting nothing. So, But this is what is really going on. So it's Q&A time. I raise my hand. And this very famous pastor says, Clint? And the guy sitting next to me goes, ooh, he knows your name. And he, he was right to do that because at that moment my cheeks flushed and I was so embarrassed at why I had done that and called attention to myself. And I realized in that moment, so much of my life is wrapped up in an experience like that. Okay. I was seeking the approval of human beings instead of being content listening to a very good speaker. Okay? I want my achievements, my approval, my accolades. I, I want these things to be known, but what does Jesus say we're to do with spiritual crowns? Cast them at his feet. Right? Anything. I, you know, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the golden wind, the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I consider it rubbish. You know what the real word is? Dung. I consider it all poo-poo. Okay? So, um, I could keep going, but I, I think you get the idea. My financial needs... Yeah, does anybody have a prayer request? Yeah, um, I'm about $1,212 short on my tuition, so would you pray with me that maybe I could start a Kickstarter and get some of my closest friends? You know, like, see what I mean? See what I'm doing? Like, there's nothing wrong with Kickstarters, and there's nothing wrong with asking people to pray, but when I'm trying to get you to know my financial needs so you'll meet it. Come on, somebody, okay? Um, God wants to be the one I thank for providing for my need, not my skill at panhandling. Okay? My prayer life, we've already covered that. The future. Um, Sarah Kelly has an old song that says, I feel the heat of your lamp on my feet guiding my ways. So why should I worry about tomorrow? From Psalm 119. And let's just be real. Right? What do I do? I want to complain. I want everybody to know things aren't going my way. And God says, nope, how about just to me? Or the amount of work it took to get where I am today, back to how you perform in the limelight of ministry success is directly related to how faithfully you rehearsed in backstage obscurity, knowing that ultimately you perform to an audience of one. Okay? So let me close this way. This all comes down to something very simple. Lots of scriptures, but very simple. It really comes to death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. So we have crucifixions 
And we have, say it with me, resurrections. And let's be real. When it comes to things I have to die to, we want, I want, private crucifixions and public resurrections. And God says, no, that's not how the kingdom works. We're going to have public crucifixions. Where was Jesus crucified? At a crossroads, so along with many other people, not on a hill far away, right? It was right there where they could be made an example of. When you have to die, and Paul says, I die daily, it's in public. And where do resurrections occur? With just a few people see it. When even his closest, when even his closest followers, and listen to me, listen to me, no woman on Jesus' team abandoned him when, when he needed them the most. So all the dudes <laughs> turn tail and run. <laughs> then they come running back, and John outruns Peter and all this. But the women were showing up just to perform the sacramental duty. But the resurrection has already occurred. I mean, they're missing the Hollywood moment, right? This is the way this is supposed to work. You're supposed to, they're supposed to be private. Okay. Um, I mean, I could go through this so much, but Paul wrote, I am crucified with Christ. That's Galatians 2.20. So I want to ask you this. In what specific ways do you need to go public with your identification with Christ? Where is God calling you to die? Resurrection, on the other hand, these are usually private affairs. Eutychus, there's just a handful of church folks nearby because Bible study went long. Dorcas, unfortunate name, in Acts 9, she's raised with the apostle Paul by himself. The Shunammite woman's son in 2 Kings, alone with the prophet Elijah. The raising of a 12-year-old girl in Luke 8 with only Mr. and Mrs. J. Iris and Peter, James, and John. Or the raising of Lazarus in Luke 11 to the overjoyed response of just his sisters, some mourners perhaps, and the amazed disciples. For goodness sake, think of Jesus' own resurrection. The pinnacle moment of human history, it just bifurcated time from B.C. to A.D. and nobody got to see it firsthand. Well, some angels, and then we have to listen to their secondhand eyewitness stories. Metaphorically, a resurrection is the work God performs in us. We cannot take pride in it. After all, we were dead to start out with before he breathed new life into our spiritual lungs. And how we respond to the limelight moments of life is directly to how faithfully we've rehearsed in backstage obscurity when we perform for an audience of one, our Heavenly Father alone. So, why are resurrections then private? They tend to make somebody a spectacle, a celebrity, a target, or in Lazarus's case, somebody that they were going to kill. Jesus advised his followers to not follow the example of the religious authorities, praying on street corners to be seen by other men. He said, but when you pray, go in your prayer closet and shut the door. I mean, come on, let's be honest. When we came to Christ, how many of us wanted our problems to disappear instantaneously? Have they? No. We're working through this process, and God is helping us. We long for God to pull out his magic wand and whisk away all of our problems, cares, and concerns. But too often, however, he displays his resurrection slowly over time as he progressively conforms you to the image of his beloved son. We want public resurrections. I want to display the things God would rather I kept hidden for only his purview as sacrificial acts of worship reserved for his glory. Usually, however, God will call us to a private comeback. So I leave you with a final image, and that's the Old Testament image. It's literal and metaphorical, okay? It's about faithfully serving God amidst obscurity. And it comes from, let's get this right, Judges 16.22. Hands on the buzzer, tough Old Testament trivia for a thousand, Alex, double jeopardy. Who am I talking about? who is Samson, okay? <laughs> Good call, all right? So here's a literal and metaphorical lesson. In here, give me a high five. <laughs> Don't leave me hanging, bro. Okay, yes. 
<laughs> nice. Notice because you didn't say who is Samson, I don't have to give you a thousand, so there you go. Um, but this is a literal and metaphorical lesson about faithfully serving God amid obscurity. But Samson's hair began to grow again after it had been shaved. But Samson's hair began to grow again after it had been shaved. You go, that's it? Seriously, you're going to end this? Well, let's picture, where's Samson? Samson is grinding grain. He is using his brute strength, his might, that had been used by God. He's supposed to be the deliverer of, of Israel, and had been used by God until he got involved in sin and concealed a bunch of things and did some something-something with Delilah. Okay, Why that woman on the radio calls herself Delilah. Seriously. Like, have you not read the Bible? But anyway, so I digress. And so he is, he's grinding grain, and, and the, the text had told us that the spirit had left him. I'm getting dizzier. Um, and, but his hair on his head began to grow, and that was the secret of his strength. He didn't know that all of that grinding grain and obscurity he was regaining the strength of God in his life. And so he's called on to come perform like a circus animal at a large gathering. And he's in this building and he asks God, will you please grant my last request? And so he pushes these pillars apart and in one fell swoop, down comes the building and he kills more of the enemies of God. Again, the theology gets a little iffy in the New Testament, but he kills the enemies of God more so in his own death than in his entire lifetime. In what specific areas of life do you need to know afresh the resurrection power of God? Surrender your pride. Will you be willing, as Samson was, to let God empower you with his resurrection power through an elongated process over time, in private, in obscurity that few people know about and nobody's tweeting about and nobody's Snapchatting, okay? The Bible... I hope, I erased them, but I hope you see that I wasn't just giving you an idea that came to Clint as a 24-year-old. This is a theme throughout the scripture, and the more I read it, I keep wanting to read that it's all about the big moments, and it's all about the limelight, and it's all about the attention, but I would be doing you a disservice. It's really all about serving God in obscurity. Thank you.